Hello everyone, welcome to our Let's Play series of Torment, Tides of Numenera. This is Carol RPG as usual, and I'm very happy that you're to join me today here in the hideout of the, well, the cast-offs. And uh, as we touch this thing over here that we didn't touch last episode, we are at the, I think it is the center of the shield or something? The shield is the shield that protects this place is really powerful over here. I'm not really sure why. I'm sh Yeah, it shows on the map. It's probably just a, a map feature, or the top of that, or anything. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We need to go and talk to Adiris down there. Uh, but yeah, and we are gonna do that. Uh, I think it is Adiris, or either that or somebody over there. Um, because he's the only one that might know a little bit about Madzoff, and apparently Madzoff is the only guy that can fix the, um, uh, what's the name of that? The the the, the thing that it's a thing. It's a thing that we have known since episode two, basically. Uh, actually, yeah, since episode two, and uh, that's the only, our, our only lead on the changing god or valve pawn things. So that's our objective right now. Let's um just um so that's just a brief summary of, of the main quest right there. Uh, so let's uh, let's see what this is and uh, see what the game throws our way. This monument tapers to a narrow point. From a distance, the obelisk appears several meters meters tall, but when you stand at the foot of it. Some kind of optical illusion makes it look as though the obelisk keeps going, rising narrower and narrower into the wide sky. Let's touch it, because why not? Touch things. Touch things! The moment your fingertip grazes the dagger-like stone, your mind is seized by cold fingers and hurled high into the air. Shreds of cloud whip past, stars streak by you and are lost in a void. Ahead, a light blooms... A a light blooms, threaded with silvery ribbons of time. You plunge into the light, and a vision of the future unfurls. You see yourself asleep, bun bundled, bundled in blankets, snoring loud enough to tear holes in the sky. Also, you're drooling. The prophetic light fades. What kind of prophetic light is this? It's not a prophetic light, this is a, a joke. Bundle. I mean... The, is that just a an hyperbole? That's not what a vision is. A vision is the opposite of an hyperbole. That's it's, it's what you're seeing. Is the disc? Hmm. Not really sure what to say. A prophetic light. The prophetic light fades, leaving you standing before the obelisk once more. You study the monument, frowning. Though the vision felt true, it hardly seemed to have been worth all that effort. Perhaps touching it again will yield different results. Well, I thought he was gonna be, <laughs> was gonna say, even though the the vision fell true, it really didn't seem like it. Uh, once more, your mind plunges into the open sky, through the grasping void beyond, and into the waiting light that holds visions of the future. You see yourself staring mournfully at a half-eaten bowl of stew. It certainly looks good, but judging by the future, by your future self-expression, it was an utter disappointment. Your okay, so this is more like visions of uh, just normal date to dayness or something? Your vision clears, leaving you before the obelisk. That vision was just as apparently useless as the last. Hmm, I wonder if it is. It, hmm, it does say apparently. Let's see. You see yourself watching the horizon with a thoughtful expression. No, wait, it's just a sneeze. Your vision clears, leaving you sta to stand up before the obelisk once more. The obelisk trembles beneath your hand, as though something has stirred or awoken within. Then your mind lances into the sky towards the prophetic star. You return to the vision of you sleeping, snorry like a keller rail. Okay, so that was an hyperbole. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's... That's... I mean, that's, you, you never know. You never know. You see yourself... Well, I don't know why I clicked there again, but... Apparently I just gained experience. You see yourself standing before a huge organic mass. Tubes and arteries pulse in the murky light, and thick tendrils extend from the mass to, unf to enfold your body. Weird alien whispers chitter and hiss in your mind. Hands close over your mind and hurl it back to, uh, back to back to, what? I suppose that's a typo. B back to Mil Avast, back to the obelisk. You stagger away from the monument, clutching your head. It seems the obelisk does show meaningful visions after all. Well... I can't say that was any less weird than the other ones, but I'm not really sure... I'm not really sure how meaningful that actually is. Uh, it's the sneezing. <gasps> you see a billowing pillar of burning, oily smoke in a ravaged throne room. You, your companions, and a handful of unfamiliar cast-offs lie motionless around. Oh. This might be... the end game? Not all the bodies are wool. Then the pillar, the sorrow, turns, unfurling long claws, reaching for you. That's the whispers that we saw before. That's the whispers 
That makes sense now. I, I couldn't understand what those are, but that's what it is. You see yourself standing before a huge organic mass. I'm an idiot. Why didn't I see that? Tubes and arteries pulse in the murky light. And thick tendrils extend from the mass to enfold your body. Weird alien whispers chitter and hiss in your mind. Okay, that's the... That's me being taken over by the sorrow. But this one is different, isn't it? No, well, well, this is the f before that, I think? You see a billowing pillar of burning, oily smoke in a ravaged throne room. I wonder what that is. You, the throne room, I mean. You, your companions, and a handful of unfamiliar cast-offs lie motionless around you. So it's cast-offs that we don't know yet. So, maybe not the ones here, because we have talked to every one of them, I hope. Uh, well, I think we have, except for um, Asper Aspergic, or whatever the, guy, the guy's name is. Not all the bodies are wool. Yeah, because they're all dead, or some of them. At least. Uh, then the pillar, the sorrow, turns unfurling long claws. You return to the vision of the pulsing mass of veins, arteries, and tendrils. Hissing, chittering voices fill your mind. Then the tendrils plunge into your body. Okay, that goes again. Oh man, but this keeps giving. You see yourself standing before a ghostly woman. She looks at you, her eyes cold and hard. Stop him, she says. He's harmed more lives than anyone can count. But who is she talking about? Is she the first cast off? And is she telling me about for me to stop the changing god? You recognize the woman, she's the same ghost you met in the fifth eye and in the labyrinth after that, but you don't know who she's talking about. Really? Hmm. So she might she's talk I think this is just a memory of a different thing of, about that particular quest. Okay, so that's me snoring. Uh that's me snoring again. Uh, you return to the vision of the ruined throne. You and your companions lie scattered across the floor like charred leaves. And the sorrow is nowhere to be seen, but you can feel it. Behind you, perhaps. Okay, so that's just a bunch of stuff that goes on. You return to the vision of conversation with the ghostly woman. She has closed eyes as if she cannot bear to look at you anymore. Hmm. So she might be talking about the... About the changing god. I wonder if that is connected, because that was a side quest. If it is connected to the main quest, that's interesting. Okay, so it doesn't... It doesn't go back to anything. I'm gonna try it three more times, or thrice more, I should say. You return to the vision of the unsatisfactory meal. Uh, your future self is poking a stale piece of... Okay, so it's just random. I think it's meant to be just random future gazing. That's an interesting thing. I mean, you've, imagine you using this as a seer. Oh, tell me, tell me! I wanna know my future! Okay, my young boy, stay a while and listen. Oh, you're eating an unsatisfactory meal of... A bowl of meal or something. I don't know. This is all that I see. Yes, that's that. You need to pay more if you want me to uh, to see things. Uh, El Kashai, we talked to him. Him? Uh, last episode. It looks like it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, it's, I can't be the only one to judge the gender of of uh, of um, of characters based on the size of their chest. That cannot be the only thing. It can't. I mean, you can't go with a hair anymore in this game, certainly. Um, but I say anymore, but it's not. It's not. That's not the word I meant. That's. Not, I know that. The men have usually used uh, worn uh, longer hair in the past than they have recently. It's it's not. I didn't mean like oh men these days use long hair. No, that's not. It's the opposite. Um, but yeah. So let's have a chat with Adiris because he or she, uh, judging by the waist and the hair, I would say she she. But uh, you never know. You really never know. Let me just save and let's go ahead and talk. I'll remember that. Even among all your siblings in Mil Avest. It's a woman! Yes! Um, <laughs> this woman is remarkably beautiful. Clad in a robe of myriad colors, she carries a... Well, it's actually not myriad, but... Uh, anyway, um, at least it doesn't look like it. Uh, clad in a, a robe of myriad colors, she carries herself with a distinct grace and ease. Her skin is dark brown, her hair a rippling midnight black. Her violet eyes blaze momentarily as you approach, and she holds up her hand. Her voice is musical and sweet. You are most welcome here, brother. I am Adiris. I am the peacekeeper. Of Mil Avest. Word of your birth and exploits has reached us here already, she smiles. News travels fast in the cast off world, as I am sure you've already seen. I know your desire to speak to Mazov. I've even heard a rumor that you can alter the past, that you restored Matkina? This is strange to me, for I have two memories on the subject. On one one in which Matkina is wall, as we all know her now, and another in which her mind is uh, incomplete? Perhaps my mind is that is the one that's incomplete. Okay, so I didn't really think I can we? Uh, mm, okay, 
so what she's talking about here, if you've forgotten, uh, Matkina, basically, we reached her in, a, in a, another refuge for the castoffs, or a refuge anyway, uh, and she gave us a mirror caster, and we went through it, because she wanted us to find a memory or something. I don't actually remember exactly what her point was, but I do remember that she telling us that it didn't matter what we did, as long as we tried to, um, well, we should try to not disturb things too much, which I didn't, admittedly, but it didn't matter what he did, because the past was the past, that was just a memory. Uh, the mirror castle was, you know, the mirror castle was the thing that held the mirror. The mirror is the memory, as far as I can tell. Uh, but then, when we changed things in there, I think I did a good thing, because she, she thanked us. Uh, but whatever I did, I, I didn't really understand how, how things went, uh, but, uh, whatever I did, I, th she, she asked if I changed the past. And I took that to mean that she, her memory had completely changed, and basically she couldn't really recall what it was, because think of it like this, I mean, your recollection of yesterday, right, uh, that's all in your mind, you can't tell if that memory is correct, unless you, you know, put it to test, like, ask, okay, I ask your, your friends, or your family, okay, I remember this being the case, uh, I remember it clear, clear, uh, clearly, so is this true, and if everything checks out, you take the memory to be accurate, um, now in this case, if we change the memory, for her, it's as if we changed the reality. If, you know, reality doesn't, you know, if nobody else tells you, no, it wasn't like that, it was something else. So if it was something completely detached from her current world, from Matkina's current world, I think I thought that was what it was, but then, okay, that's just my perspective, I'm, I don't know. But yeah, perhaps her mind is the one that's incomplete. It's still open. The thing is, it's still open, my interpretation doesn't... Oh, boy. Okay, well, I, I, I think this might be inconsequential, but let's see. I do have a mirror caster here, as I feared. Well, I expected, actually. I do have a mirror caster here, she says, in which Madzoff is said to appear. But, oh, this, maybe we're gonna be able to put this to test. But he is a friend to me, as are all our family, eventually. And I do wish to expose him to danger. And I do not wish to expose him to danger, she says. She shakes her head and smiles slightly. I must apologize, I, I do not mean to be rude, but if there is any chance it is true, I have some time, some limited psychic ability. If you will permit me, I would examine your mind to get a, a, the truth of these rumors about your powers. Uh... I... Hmm. If you must, let's trust this strange, beautiful woman. I suppose. I don't know. I, I, can't, I want to trust her. I, don't, I can't really make up, or make up a reason for my character to trust her right now. But this... I, I, I feel my character might be growing in power in the sense that I think he's... I don't know, the fact that we kind of broke the shield when we got here, or broke the portal anyway, to get here, um, I think maybe my character wants to become a little bit more reckless from now on, and, uh, I mean, we've seen so many things since we started, it's, it's weird, so let's make, let's turn our character into a little bit more reckless, also to satisfy my curiosity, really, um, because I really want to know, yeah, don't, po don't probe too deeply, though. This, oh, what happened there? Uh, an indigo tide. Yeah, yeah, it's changing the tides, I think. This will take but a moment, she says. She places gentle fingers on your forehead, and you feel a swirl of color thrill your innermost core. A kaleidoscope of emotion shakes you. A gamut of experiences recognized and echoed, magnif uh, magnified and reflected. When she removes her hand, her eyes are wet with tears. Forgive my doubt, brother. I believe you now. I believe you are capable of changing reality. Okay, so that confirms it. Why would our sire have given him this ability? A side effect, perhaps, or... Oh, and that's her thinking. I'll remember that. She holds up her slender finger. But if anything, this makes me more leery of handling... Uh, of handing you a brother's mere cast. Or mere caster. If you wish to speak to Mazov, you must prove to me that you... That you can be entrusted with the minds of one of our brethren. You cured Machina. But did you understand that, Tash? Did you take care of his innermost self as well? Before I can give you this mere caster, I would have you speak with Melmoth Leviarn. I know Leviarn. you're busy, but could we talk? Sure, Rin. Just wait a little bit. It is not my contention, says Adiris, that we draw the sorrow to us with our abuse of the tides, which is why I do not use our tidal powers. I believe our use of the powers is inherently painful to those around us. Well, I think so, actually. I... I've seen proof of that. That the slaver that we found, 
apparently had the same issue, I think. Uh, for instance, she says, was anyone with you when you awoke to consciousness? Uh, yeah, two people. An Aeon priest named Aligurn and a Nano named Calistige. They were arguing as I woke. I'd wager any simmering tension snapped into sharp focus, she says. If they were lovers, for example, they might have fallen deep into love spell. But if they were breaking apart, your blast of tidal energy would have riven them, destroyed their relationship. And she pauses and you feel the tickle of her mind on yours. That's what happened, isn't it? They were not arguing for nothing. Go to see Melmoth. Ask him about the tides. When you've done that, we will speak further. Will... Will you give me the mirror caster after that? Perhaps, she says. Eventually, I must know what that you will take responsibility when you hold Zarian's life, his history, in your hands. You will not have the mirror caster until I am satisfied. Uh, but what if I don't do it? Well, it came all this way, through the cultists of the valley and even breaking through our locked portal. What I ask is a simple thing. I'm, I'm sure you, you will see the wisdom of it. Hold a moment, says Aligurn. You seem like a fair-minded person. The others here seem to defer to you. So let me ask, if the Changing God was here right now, what you, would you say to him? What would you do to him? Oh, that's just Aligurn measuring her, measuring the trust he can ha have in her. Oh, that's really cool. If that is the case, that's really cool because it's an NPC try collecting data to make his own decision. If that is the case, that's awesome. I tell him what he was... Uh, what he has wrought in our persons, says Adiris. I'd ask him why he encourages strife, or I'd engage him in a discussion about morality. And she smiles a little. But tell me, mortal man, what is it you truly want to say? I want justice, says Aligurn, and I don't know how to get it. You're created a changing god. He was responsible for what happened to my village. So it all checks out so far. Oh my god, this is so brilliant. This is awesome. This never... I've, I, I can't remember seeing this ever happening in any video game that I've ever seen. Or any RPG, anyway, that I've ever seen. I mean, video games, it makes... You know, in a non-player-character-centric in a non -player character -centric game, it, it's more common. Uh, or it's common, actually. Uh, but this is awesome because he's... Ma it's like he's playing his own game. And he is. He's, he's playing his own game. Oh, man. Uh, but how was the Changing God responsible... For what happened to your village, though, I never really understood. Let's ask him why he hasn't told me this before. I did, says Aligarn, at the monument. I just didn't tell you it was the Changing God who was responsible. Ah, he looks down at his boots. Back in Orman, when I was the Aeon Priest for my aldea, I found a frame. A black metal piece. I was looking it over in my workshop, trying to figure out what to do with it. A traveler came through my town. He looked a lot like you, actually, though without the burn scar or the visible tattoo. If you're not the Changing God, then it was your creator in your body who told me to activate the frame and how. Then he left town. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but he scratches. Well, I activated the frame. Black monster spilled all, all tooth and claw. I got knocked out. When I woke, everyone was gone. No trace. The only thing that was different, the monsters scarred me. Their attack left these tattoos all up and down my arms, a poison that whispers in my mind, and constant reminder that I failed everyone I ever loved. Because you followed the Changing Gods? Even, it wasn't even his advice, it was your decision, though. Right? A traveler came through my town. I, I don't remember he, actually what he told us before, so I might, I might be misspoke, misspoke, misspeaking here. So, just as a, as a heads up right here. Uh, so, a he looked a lot like you, a black piece, I was looking, yeah, so, I found a frame, a black metal piece, I was looking it over in my workshop, trying to figure out what to do with it, I wonder if that was a meter caster, okay, a traveler came through my town, he looked a lot like you, uh, it told me, who told me to activate the frame, ah, okay, okay, so I misread, good, 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 uh, that was the changing god's gift to me, he says, I loaded the frame, took it to Sega's Cliffs, Orth found, promised, me, uh, promised to help me. He found out he could fold it down, but that's as far as we got, ever got. Never even figured out who made it or why. And in the meantime, I've been looking for the Changing God, to try to find out what he knows. Why did he have me activate the frame? What happened to my family? And if I don't like the answers? His smile is grim and deadly, and his tattoo hums and hiss with power. I... Yeah. 
I'll help you find out the truth, Alligern. Sure you will. Adiris holds a hand to his face and he steals. Alligern, what's past is past. Do you want aid? Do you want answers? Because if you do, your companion here is the one who will guide you to them. If you let your rage blind you and poison you, you will never find the truth. Look to the future and... Well, do not forget the past. Never that. Let the past guide you, but do not let it poison you. She steps back. Here, a gift of knowledge for you. One of the blessings, or curses perhaps, is that a cast-off... Is that as cast-offs, she says, we can on occasion find flashes of our creator's memories inside our bodies. Should you find a frame that was the cause of your miseries, our friend might be able to shake loose a memory from our sire. I don't guarantee its success, but... She studies you for a moment. If this is the changing god, the damage from the fall has done significant harm. I don't think I am the changing god, but it, what she says is true. If I am, then what has happened? Your best hope is to travel with him, says Adiris. Perhaps you can find the answers you seek, but I pray you find peace in your heart. As she speaks, you can feel the tides roll gently off of her, softening the walls Alligurn has constructed in his mind. He looks skeptical. I'll try. No guarantees. That's all anyone can ask, says Adiris. Now, do either of you have any other business with me? Uh, yeah, actually, my er my companion er my Eretis, yes, my companion Eretis has demons in his mind. Do you know, uh, well, actually, literal demons this time around. Uh, do well, I say this time around, it's more of a reference. Anyway, do you know uh, of any healers that can help him? Maybe she can. Her gaze moves to Eretis. Oddly, he is silent. St silent, somber, and looking at you. Adiris turns back to you. We do not like this. We do not like it either. What can we do? Nothing but dig deeper and deeper. Hmm. No, says Adiris. The only cast-off healers I know are elsewhere, tending to those who can actually be injured. My apologies. Yeah, I think we really need to go to the fifth eye. I'm pretty sure that's the case. Where is Mazov? You mean physically? That I do not know. He was captured by the Gibra of Murajolio several years ago. A prisoner for their men menagerie, but no one knows what became of him afterward. You will be very difficult to find outside of the mirror caster, but you will have to convince me you are ready to take over your brother's life first. Okay, so that explains how that's, that clears up. I, I, I figured that was the case, that we were going to need to change the past to make sure he doesn't get captured and comes over here or something? Hmm. Tell me about yourself, Adiris. I keep the peace here in Mill Avest. Our sire brought the Jack Dream to Sagas Cliffs and uh, my body. Did you know that? She shakes her head. That the conflict they seek to start, the wars, I swore that I would make no deaths in my lifetime, bring no pain. I came here in the wake of the first death, and her loyalists were at the throats of our sires. I brought peace to them. They agreed we would make Mil Avis the sanctuary. This is my achievement, my legacy. Can I just muse a little bit about bring no pain? This is a, well, it's a very noble, it's a very noble, uh, and, 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 uh, it's not beautiful is not the word. Uh, you know, it's a very noble goal. Uh, very not condescendent. What's the word? Damn it! I, I I can't figure out the word. I, there's a word for this. Basically, it, it, you know, it, you're you're a nice person, right? There's a word for that. There's a proper word for what I'm trying to say. Uh, but the thing is, this is all about perspective, and this can, this objective can be. I'm I'm not saying it's in her. I just wanted to muse a, muse a little bit about this. But this can be given to a. a of a villain, if you want. If you're writing a story, and uh, if you want a villain to have this goal in life, if he wants to bring no pain, you can conjure up or you can make up um, situations where he doesn't actually bring any pain, depending on the perspective. Because imagine this, uh, somebody crashes into you and you have your arms stretched out. Uh, well, like in, in a fist thing, but out of, you know, you, you, don't, you didn't really see that person crashing into you. You effectively punch them. You didn't really bring any pain to them because the action wasn't immediately yours, but you also didn't avoid the situation or didn't do anything out of either your decision or out of, you know, not knowledge or anything that you could avoid that pain from taking place. So, in fact, not bringing any pain is not really the... Uh, it shouldn't be really an objective. The objective should be soothing pain or avoiding it, trying to make it better. But that, you know, that problem with that, the problem with that is 
if you can justify your position in a way that you actually bring no pain but let others bring pain onto themselves, you're still being evil. You can be evil like that while bringing actually no pain. You know what I mean? Because if you don't help them, and if you knowingly let them go to a place where they bring pain upon themselves, you know, you can be evil. So if, if you, in order for you not to be evil, you would need to, this is the beauty of this, you would need to try to make sure pain doesn't actually take place. So you need to take an action in the case of somebody crashing into you while you have your fist stretched out. Um, but the thing is, for that to happen, sometimes to make sure pain doesn't happen, you need to make pain. You need to bring pain to make sure pain doesn't happen. So that's the point, that's the problem, that's the eternal conundrum. It's the war, to make war, to stop war. It's, yeah, the pain itself is not the issue. It never is. It's like war itself is not the issue, it's the objectives that you have. Um, but yeah, so that's, I, I feel that her bring no pain there might be a little bit shallow, but that's noble, that's noble of her. I, I yeah, I d definitely do agree with that, but sorry about that little uh, rant, it's not, it's not a rant, it's just, you know, I wanted to muse a little bit on that. Uh, why would you feel guilty about our sire bringing the Jack Dream to Sega's Cliffs? Is, it wasn't you, what is the Jack Dream actually, I don't really understand, it wasn't you. True, says Adiris, and yet, the Jack Dream knew me. Knew me under a name and a history that wasn't my own. The killers, the haters, the ones who wanted to see blood and death, they would tell me of their schemes. They wanted my approval, and any action on my part, they took as such. She stares down at her hands. I've never taken a life, but blood stains me. I can't feel that again. Ever. Okay, so yeah, that explains why she has that. Okay, that makes sense. And also why it's so simplistic, because it's so driven by uh, un unreasonable... Uh, feeling. It's not. I'm not saying that she's not entitled to that feeling, but it's unreasonable in the sense that it's more emotional than anything else. The fact that she feels tainted by what Changing God did with her body. Well, while in her body. Well, while he was her. What? Anyway, you brought the Jack Dream using my body. She says, "I can't be sure it wasn't me." Well, uh, sure. So we'll put you in charge of Mule Abist. Why no one did? I saw the need and forced and forged the peace myself. I saw a path to avoid the bloodshed. And I set my feet upon it. With my end goal in mind, those who would oppose me saw that I had set my ideals and would not deviate from them. And since my plan did not involve exa exalting myself over them, did not put them at a disadvantage, who could say no? Indeed, I am in charge only insofar as they allow it. They are the ones who enforce the peace. I just speak of it. Okay, that makes total sense. Uh, I will ask more questions of you, but only on the next episode. For right now, it's... Farewell, I guess. There's a, a lot of stuff that we can ask. Well, actually, that's that one and that one, I think. Um, but yeah, that's going to be that for right now. I'm Colonel RPG, and this has been Torment Tides of Numenera. I really hope you've enjoyed it. And if you did, go ahead and leave a comment, like the video. But above all, thank you so much for watching and for bearing with me after so many episodes and after so many rants and so, so many deviations from the point. But hopefully you're enjoying it because I am absolutely loving it. So thank you very much once again, and I hope to see you next episode. Bye-bye.